Hello, once again, this is Omar Bola Steven, the host of the Back Story with Omar Bola Steven. On the show, we like to focus on disruptive mindship conversations, yet constructive in nature, on topics or subjects covering society and culture, science and technology, government and politics, and also the economy. Uh, we realize that all of the changes that we need in life can only come if we're ready to embrace the changes uh, that um, life offers to us. Joy, it may be inconvenient, it may be uncomfortable, uh, but uh, when we focus on what is truly important and also embrace these changes that comes along. I guarantee you that we are really truly going to have a transformed life and also in the world in general. This is the mission and the focus of the Paxo with Mobile Last TV. We like to shine more light on what has not worked and what we make it work. Today I have Jack Decker, who is the author of the state's first amendment on the Paxo with me. Welcome to the show, Jack Decker. Thank you for having me. Thanks for joining me on the show, uh, Jack Decker. Uh, I'm looking forward to a really great time. We'll be talking about the state's first amendment, and uh, that's the core of our uh, discussion today. Um, why do you, or why are you an advocate of the state's first amendment? Uh, because I, uh, in the United States of America, uh, we have federal government, state governments, and there's a lot of duplication of government services at the federal level that's already done at the state level. And this duplication of services uh, as a level of complexity and um, wasted effort on both uh, ends. I think that uh, state governments are better able to handle a lot of the problems because they're closer to the problem than the federal government is. Um, the federal government is in Washington, DC, and we have states in Alaska and Hawaii in our places, um, I believe the state governments are better able to address the problems and the needs of their states that the one size fits all approach of the federal government uh, just is not um, suited to do. And I believe if uh, this amendment would reduce the amount of duplication, let's saving taxpayer money and effort and time and energy uh, by both citizens and businesses in uh, those states. Uh, so it is, um, it does that by uh, basically creating a new politician in a way. It makes, right now in the United States of America, we have federal politicians and they can only influence the nation by passing federal laws, uh, state politicians that can only influence uh, their state by state laws. Um, I create a, a hybrid where it's a, a politician is both a federal politician and a state politician. Uh, they can vote on federal issue, federal laws, introduce federal laws, and introduce and vote on state laws. And this, I believe, gives them a, a, an, an advantageous uh, position where they can think what would be best handled at the federal level and what would be best handled at the state level. And there's a lot of duplication between that the federal government does of the state levels, but that's simply because federal politicians can only pass federal laws. And so they want to influence like education. They have to uh, pass a federal law about education. Well, with my amendment, it creates a politician that's both a federal politician and a state politician. So they can decide, uh, is this like for the education law, is this better handled at the federal level or is this better handled at the state level? I believe that the majority of the laws that they can will be done at the state level. If they can be done at the state level, I think the states will want to do it at the state levels. Uh, this does not eliminate the federal government because there's certain things that, that are best done at the federal government, like national defense. Um, we have a department called the State Department, which is actually misleading. It's actually our diplomacy department, uh, international diplomacy. The State Department, have, the ambassadors are from the uh, State Department. And there's the Treasury, which prints the national currency. And I think these three functions are best done at the federal level. And I think the states will agree that's best done at the federal level. But there's our um, federal departments, like Federal Department of Education, um, interior, which is our uh, state parks, uh, transportation, our highway system, et cetera, that I believe is better handled at the state level um, because there's, um, the United States is a very large country. Um, we have every type of terrain, uh, uh, climate, except for Arctic in our country. We have 
down in Florida, we have swamps. And on the West Coast, we have oceans and coastlines. And in and, and, uh, Florida, we have hurricanes. On the West Coast, we have earthquakes. In the Midwest, we have blizzards and tornadoes. Um, and I think um, the federal government's approach of one size fits all doesn't adequately service all these very different climates as well as different industries. Um, we have a Mississippi, which is a major transportation line, but that's only for those states that are connected to the Mississippi. Uh, there are states that are the, the West Coast and East Coast are not connected to the Mississippi. They have the oceans that they use for their transportation and smaller rivers. Um, and then there's issues such like um, industries or certain industries like uh, in the Midwest is, is heavily agriculture because we have the, the plains of the, of the Midwest, which are very fertile land because of the Mississippi. Uh, it, it floods and, and the flooding of it creates a uh, 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 nutrient-rich soils for them. Um, but there's also, uh, like San Francisco is our, our tech um, capital uh, where we have high tech. Um, your viewers might know like Google, Microsoft, um, uh, Twitter are all based in California in San Francisco area. Um, and then there's other like the, our our um, business center is New York City, which is on the East Coast. And this is where major corporations are. Um, your viewers might know like General Motors, um, all the broadcast networks are, are based in our headquarters in uh, New York City. Um, so is I, I believe because we're such a varied nation um, that the federal government's one size fits all can't adequately service the country. So I think it's best for the states to do that. I guess to talk about the amendments, the first okay. amendment, um, what does it consist of? Uh, state's first amendment, um, you only go through the issue of the sections? Yes, uh, I'd like us to talk about uh, what it consists of, uh, because this is what we're focusing on. We're focusing on the state force amendment, and you are an advocate of this uh, state force amendment. I'd like us to um, talk a bit about what it consists of. We would okay, like to um, address it. Sure. Uh, uh, section one and two talks about the creation of uh, this hybrid politician I talked about, which is both a federal politician and a state politician. And uh, the Section one is each state gets one vote in the U.S. Senate. That vote goes to the state's current governor. Uh, current governor can serve as the U.S. vice president, and governors cannot be compensated any way or form to their service to the U.S. Senate or the office of the vice U.S. vice president. Section two is each state's votes in the U.S. House of Representatives is equally divided amongst all the state's current state assembly members. Each current state assembly member is a full member of the U.S. House of Representatives and none of them can be compensated in any way or form for their service to the U.S. House of Representatives. Um, what this does is it brings the, the U.S. federal government into the 21st century. Uh, what we're doing right now, what you and I are doing right now, was not possible when my country was founded in, in 1970, uh, 1776. Uh, back then, the fastest mode of communication was by horse or ship, and the, the roads had to be uh, you could you, roads had to be um, you could you had to be able to travel across the roads if they were too muddy if the weather went bad um, and uh, or on with ships if there was bad weather at sea it would influence how fast um, communication could happen so back in 1776 uh, all the U.S. House the federal government had to meet in Washington D.C. to be able to effectively and smoothly um, uh, communicate with each other. But today, well, like what we are doing right now, the video conferencing is possible. So all of these U.S. houses, the U.S. senators and U.S. House of Representatives can be back in their states and their districts and communicate by way of video conferencing as we're doing right now. Uh, there, You can watch online um, a lot of the committees and subcommittees um, actually do their business by watching it on uh, video conferencing, uh, a live video. And I think that is a better way of doing it. Uh, gets the 
uh, U.S. senators and uh, U.S. House of Representatives back among the people that elected them, gets them out of Washington, D.C., which is uh, where a lot of lobbyists are able to um, influence uh, a lot of Americans, say, negatively, uh, legislation. Um, we call it, those that really don't like Washington, D.C., call it the swamp. Um, like as in uh, alligators and snakes and et cetera, uh, rather a negative view of it. Well, um, this essentially eliminates the swamp by, by removing the senators and U.S. House of Representatives from them, puts them back in their areas. Now, my feeling is that once the U.S. senators, there are two in every state gets two in the U.S. House of uh, the U.S. Senate. Once you put them back in the, into their states, well, Okay, like, what are they there for then? I believe um, the governors, uh, the state governors represent their states. In fact, um, I don't know in, in the history of the United States of any governor that did not view uh, him or herself representing uh, their state. If you, ask, if you ask any state resident who represents your state, they will say their governor. So I think we can just eliminate, since the U.S. senators are already kind of back in their states, I think we can just give their votes to the governors and have them represent their states in the U.S. Senate. So there are 50 governors, there are 100 U.S. senators, so we just basically go from two votes of every state to one vote of every state so that the U.S. Senate is now 50 votes as opposed to 100. And then the same thing is with the House of Representatives. Uh, saying them back to their states, well, there's in every state has a state assembly members, kind of like the U.S. House of Representative at the uh, U.S. House of Representatives at the state level is called a state assembly. I believe we took just the votes that those states get in U.S. House of Representative and divide amongst uh, the state assembly members, we can get rid of employing a separate body of politicians to say U.S. House of Representatives and just have those votes go to the state assembly members. And that way, um, now I create a high, the hybrid politician I talked about, which is one that is both a federal politician and a state politician um, by just eliminating the current U.S. House of Representatives and the current uh, U.S. Senators. The, their positions are not eliminated, but they're just transferred. The state senators' positions are transferred to the state governor. The U.S. House of Representatives position is transferred to the state assembly members. And then Section 3, which is uh, all state, all U.S. senators can propose and vote in legislative bills from their state. All U.S. House of Representatives can propose and vote on legislative bills from their uh, district and state capital. And all congressional committees and subcommittee means uh, must be conducted by way of video conferencing. That's just a parliamentary rule uh, section talking about how to, um, how the, the is now hybrid politicians can uh, propose and vote on legislative bills. Uh, in our in our country, there's very famous um, um, historical events where they you have to vote. Right now, you have to be on the floor of the U.S. Senate to propose bills and vote on. You have to be in the U.S. House of Representatives, the floor of it, the physical floor of the U.S. House of Representatives to vote and, and to propose and vote on bills in the state legislature and uh, U.S. House of Representatives. This is Section 3 just enables them to do that from their home state. Um, so that, this creates the, the hybrid politician I talk about. Um, and I think if this will result with, uh, in a, I think a very fast, but with some cases gradual uh, change in the federal government is where the state, these hybrid politicians would decide what should be done at the federal level, what should be done at the state level. And then I think a lot of this is, I don't think they're ever going to eliminate any, any state uh, department, but I think they can, they'll eliminate almost all federal departments that duplicate what they're doing currently at the state level. So again, like I said before, I think the of all the federal departments, I think there will eventually only be three, which is the Defense Department, which is our national defense, the State Department, which is our international diplomacy, and the Treasury Department, which is what prints our national currency, the US dollar. Um, that's... Uh, the, uh, the cornerstone of the amendment is, is this change. I, I can talk about the other sections of how it makes our little changes that makes that even better if you like. Uh, you would like me to? Okay. Uh, section four has, says the U.S. 
uh, president must physically visit every state and union and U.S. territory at least once a year. Um, first president, our first president of the United States was George Washington. He was actually, um, before he was the president of the United States, he was the general of the Revolutionary Army that that um, got us to, um, to that won our independence from the British Empire. He became the, our first president. And he would, and he felt it was very important for the people that he represented to see him. So he, there was only thirteen states at that time. Uh, he personally went to each of those states so that the local population could see who uh, is governing them. He thought that was very important. The next president to visit all all states was Richard Nixon, which was a recent president. I think it's very important that the president goes and visits every state so they, the, the, the states have a chance um, to make the president aware of their conditions and, and the, the, popula the local populations can see him. He has a chance to interact with the, uh, the governors and the state assembly members there. Uh, there are 50 states in the United States of America. There are 52 weeks in the year. I believe each state will demand that the president spends one week a year in their state. And that way, when they, and then they have the attention of not only the president, but the national press, the, the nation will pay attention to their state for one week a year. And I think that's a really good thing. And um, because all the governors are actually also uh, U.S. senators and the state assembly members are also U.S. House of Representatives, uh, the president has a very big incentive to, to talk to them because they will be voting on federal legislation that he will either veto or pass or pocket veto is called. Um, so he's not going to be treating these governors or and state assembly members in a bad way because he needs their votes to pass any legislation he wants to pass, such as like uh, the national budget. And um, I think also the U.S. territories should see the president. They won't get a week, <laughs> you know, but when the U.S. president is over in Hawaii, um, he, he, he can, um, the U.S. president flies in what we call Air Force One, which is a, a 747 jumbo jet. And on that jet, he actually has, uh, I think it's a king size bed that he can actually sleep in like you would in a hotel. He can actually sleep on the jet. And so he could go from Hawaii, they'll get there a week, and then there's a lot of little territories we have around in the Pacific area. He could fly to them sleeping overnight and then spend a day or two in each of the U territories like Guam and um, other states, uh, islands there. And he can do likewise when he's over in uh, visits um, on the East Coast, like Hawaii, I mean, Florida, <laughs> not Hawaii, in Florida. He Absolutely. He could fly over and visit Puerto Rico, uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands for a day or two. I think Puerto Rico would get at least two days. Uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands might get one day. Uh, but he has two weeks to visit all the U.S. territories. And I think that'd be a very good thing. Um, I, and then, and then, but that enables then Section 5. You want me to go into that? The final? Of course, uh, no, of course, uh, sure. for hearing um, these uh, sections and subsections uh, with my audience, uh, um, do you think... Uh, this set objectives that you have on your table as an advocate of the state sports amendment, don't you think they are very challenging enough? Challenging enough for who? For, for... Yeah, I'm talking as you are an advocate of the state sports amendment, and now you've read uh, the sections and some of the subsections of this amendment. And uh, now, um, don't you think uh, they pose some kind of challenges on the way? How do you hope to achieve all of these uh, objectives in the long, long run? Um, to actually make this become reality, uh, I, I think it is um, possible because in, in the United States, um, we have a U.S. Constitution. In the U.S. Constitution, we have a section of it that enables the states to have what's called constitutional convention. Um, the states can call a constitutional convention without asking for permission from the U.S. President or Congress. And they can call this and make amendments to the Constitution without um, totally independent of the President and, the, and Congress. This amendment here 
<laughs> the way I put it is, I'm not playing to a politician's good nature to make this amendment pass. I'm playing to their bad nature. All politicians want more power. And I believe this gives the state politicians more political power. It gives the governors, see right now the states are kind of um, subservient to the federal government. Uh, the, the federal government can do, does something, pass a law, and the states have to basically react to it. Um, the federal government laws supersede state laws. And so they're in a subservient uh, position to the federal government. My amendment enables the state politicians to directly impact the federal government. They're the ones that are going to be passing the laws and voting on the laws. And um, it gives them more power. It's, thus, it gives them more, I believe, that gives them the incentive to uh, pass this amendment because all politicians like more power. The joke is never stand between a politician and more power. <laughs> They'll just run right over you. Uh, so this gives them an incentive to pass this amendment. Um, I think that is the, the real reason why this might actually get passed is because it gives the state politicians more power and they have the ability because of our con how our constitution is written to call a constitution convention and, and pass this legislation without the president or the Congress having any input. But I actually think in this aspect that um, the US senators will want this amendment as well. Uh, again, don't stand between a politician and more power. Um, U.S. senators um, had to win statewide elections to become a U.S. senator, just like a governor had to win, win a statewide election to be a governor. To a, so to a U.S. senator, here's an opportunity for him to um, literally double the power he has or she has in the U.S. Senate and get the power of the state governorship. And so all politicians are have massive egos you can't be a you can't be a politician without a, a massive ego because of just think of the the sling the mud that is thrown at them during campaigns and the scrutiny that they are under if you didn't have a, a massive healthy ego you'd be just crushed um by running for office and so i think they all will think hey, i can win the governorship you know, so when they look at this amendment going, this is well, it does kick them out of their office, it, it fires them. Well, but this says, but it gives them, oh, I can go for the governorship, and thus, I, by winning the governorship, I power in the U.S. Senate, and I could actually see them whenever they meet, they don't meet all the time, is when, but when they're in session. They could meet still in Washington, D.C., but I have a feeling that what they would do is every time they meet in session, they'll meet in a, in a different state. Uh, each state has a U.S. Supreme, has a state Supreme Court, and I believe when the U.S. Supreme Court comes to their state, the state Supreme Court will, will uh, make a nice gesture and vacate their, their court room. So the U.S. Supreme Court can come in and sit there while, the, while they're in session and then you know, it'd be a nice way for them to, uh, again, do a little good PR for for the U.S. Supreme Court. But this right. Now, 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 uh, right, right. And Jack, let's look at the ongoing challenge and to define um, free speech. Uh, sure. We like to talk about the ongoing challenge uh, to define free speech. As we all know that this amendment protects freedom of speech. I'm talking about the first, uh, the state's first amendment. It protects the freedom of speech, uh, the press, the assembly, and the right to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Now, I would like you to um, share your perspective on the ongoing challenges uh, to define um, free speech at this moment. Uh, the free, I, I, I'm very happy with the current um, status of free speech in America. Um, we have. Um, we have a constitutional right in our country to freedom of speech and we have an independent judiciary that protects that right um, the, that, I think all the other countries in the world have a parliamentary form of government uh, the United Kingdom has a parliamentary form of government France has a parliamentary form of government is the, is the norm worldwide uh, the problem with the parliamentary form of government is that they don't have an independent uh, 
judicial branch. It be, because all the power, all the political power is in the parliament and the parliament wants that power. And um, if, the, if, there's, if a country's Supreme Court rules against something that the parliament passed, um, the parliament can just um, change. They can just fire everyone in their Supreme Court. Uh, they could just make another law to pass it. Um, are the constant the United U.S. Constitution, the federal government, the U.S. Supreme Court protects that, um, and is and they can, they have routinely throughout our history struck down laws at the federal level, state level, local level that has violated the um, freedom of speech. Um, this is a great thing about the, the, I think it's the only country in the world that has a true independent, uh, judiciary branch. Um, it, it, you know, the way I, I'm a libertarian, um, libertarians are for a, a good way of putting what a libertarian is, is we're fiscally respectful, socially tolerant. Um, uh, another way of putting it is we want more liberty, less government, um, the First Amendment is very important. Uh, the First Amendment basically is not about, it is about speech that you find disgusting. Okay? It protects disgusting speech. Um, it's not about, First Amendment doesn't protect speech you agree with. First Amendment protects uh, speech you disagree with. And, and without that, um, all views cannot be expressed. Uh, those in power, in some countries, they have what's called hate laws. And in the United States, we have no hate laws. Once you allow, once you allow a certain speech to be outlawed, it's kind of a slippery slope from that point. Well, then how about this speech? And you, you start just outlawing, outlawing. Um, in the United Kingdom, you can literally be arrested for a tweet. You can, you can put out a tweet and the police will come and arrest you. And here in America, when I tell that to Americans, many of them don't believe that would even happen. They, they're just astounded that you could be arrested for a tweet. Uh, but that's what actually has happened. And even for just a joke. Um, so I, I, I'm very happy with the U.S. Uh, First Amendment. It's not perfect. Um, but I think it's the, it's the best of the world right now um, for protecting the freedom of speech. Uh, there's also in the First Amendment, there's a freedom of the press, which enables the press to um, not be censored by the federal government, even though our, we've, ha we've had recently cases where the Biden administration has tried to censor speech on social platforms like Twitter and Facebook and, and Google and YouTube. And that's very unfortunate. Uh, fortunately, again, our court system has come in and routinely um, struck down has prohibited the the executive branch president by currently from doing that and that's a very good thing for our, uh for our country as far as freedom of speech freedom of press goes uh we also have freedom of religion uh there's no state there's no state uh religion in our country um and there's also a freedom of assembly uh, the right, basically, the right to go out and protest. In our country, it has to be peaceful. You can't have a violent protest. Um, as long as you're peaceful, uh, you can go out and protest anything you want. Um, that recently, again, has been a problem because we just recently had a, a court decision that there was where the police were arresting protesters of one side of a political issue and not the other side. And the judge says you can't do that. Uh, if you if you arrest the political protesters that are advocating one position, you can't do that and not arrest the protesters of the other position at that um, event that are just being as violent, if not more violent. And so that that's just a recent, like I think when last week that decision came down. The, the judge threw out all the arrests uh, that the police had made because they only arrested one side that was protesting and they didn't arrest anyone on the other side. So I think that's a great thing about this country. The courts Thanks are protecting- Thanks so much, Jack Jacob. Thanks for sharing your thoughts on the show. Uh, talking about uh, the State's First Amendment, uh, Jack Jacob is the author of the State's First Amendment. Uh, 
Thank you once again for sharing your thoughts. Do you have any exciting news that you would like to share with my audience? Perhaps you have any projects in the pipeline that's very interesting to my audience. Um, oh, I mean, like what, what they can do to um, follow this further? Is that, if they, if they, no, if they would like um, to... My audience would like to know if you have any exciting news you would like to share with them. Or perhaps you have a project in the pipeline that is a, a great well, um, feat for my audience to learn about. Yeah, well, right now there's, um, if, the, if they would like to follow what I'm doing, right now, if they went to Twitter and they follow my account on Twitter, which is uh, the at symbol Jack T. Decker, uh, that's about the only thing that uh, right now they can do. Um, and I post like when, if you send me a link to in this, um, interview goes live um i'll i'll tweet out the link to all my twitter followers and um so they can uh watch or listen to this uh, program as well um so that that's something that they could do <laughs> if they wanted to uh this is the only project i'm working on right now thanks so much for that uh any other any projects you embark upon i and my audience wish you the best in all of that <laughs> 